everybody? Oh. Testing. Okay, now it's working. All right, welcome to our second Ocean X talk. I'm really excited to introduce Kazoji Matson Margulis, who is a Puyallup tribal member who has worked with the tribe's shellfish department since 2010. Her recent focus has been diving to survey populations of commercially harvested species in Puget Sound. She also works in conjunction with University of Washington Tacoma and Harbor Wild Watch on a variety of projects aimed towards understanding and protecting our waters and their inhabitants. She is currently earning a degree at the University of Washington Tacoma in environmental science with a focus on marine ecology. A working musician since 2001, Hazoji pr pursues her love of music and live performance while doing work that nurtures her love for the Salish Sea. Over to you. What's up, y'all? <laughs> I don't know if you get really dry mouth when you're nervous, but I do, so I'm always putting on more and more chapstick <laughs> anytime I have to do anything like this. And this sort of thing is very new to me, so I'm going to be fifth grade book report style and just <laughs> read from this piece of paper. <laughs> um, thank you guys for having me. This is awesome. I'm super excited. Um, they asked me to come here today to share my story. So I want to start out uh, with a quick background on my upbringing that I think is relevant to how I ended up here today. I need my hand to stop shaking. <laughs> um, I was born and raised here in Tacoma, Washington on the Puyallup Tribes Reservation. Both my parents were born and raised in this region as well. They met and fell in love in the 60s, which, as you probably know, was a particularly tumultuous time in our country. And here in Washington State, there was a battle happening between local tribes and the state over fishing territory and dwindling resources. <laughs> um, the events around the struggle became known as the Fishing Wars and stemmed back to a treaty that was signed in 1854 between the state and native populations, which ensured the tribes that they would be allowed to fish in all of their usual and accustomed places. That treaty was called the Medicine Creek Treaty, and at that time, in the 60s, it was not being honored. Harvesting food from local waters is a hugely important part of the culture of native people in this region, so taking that away from them went much deeper than taking food from their mouths. In response to this conflict, native fishermen began staging peaceful protests in the form of fish-ins, which was simply the act of them going down to the river and fishing, but which that was now illegal, so they were being arrested and sometimes assaulted for. These battles went all the way to the Supreme Court, which ultimately ruled in the tribe's favor, and created the 50-50 split of natural resources between the tribes and the state that exists still here to this day. Um, I'm going to explain the slides that we're looking at here real quick. This one here is a newspaper clipping from the Tacoma News Tribune, I assume. Um, and this is three women going around collecting bail money for the fishermen that had been arrested for fishing on the river. This woman in the middle is my mom. Uh, this picture here is three fishermen shoving a boat out onto the river to fish to uh, participate in a fish-in, and there is a group of women standing on the riverbed in solidarity with them. This woman here is my grandmother, my mom's mom. This one here is at the, uh, on the steps of the Capitol in Olympia, and uh, it's a protest regarding the fishing wars. This guy with the bullhorn here is my grandfather, that's my mom's dad. And then this photo is of Marlon Brando, who came, he's one of a couple celebrities that came down to the river to show support of the tribes. And so they got a you know, press opportunity of him pulling fish from the river. And this teenager here with his jaw dropped open is my uncle Paul, my mom's brother. <laughs> so um, as you can see, my parents and my mom's family were very much involved in the struggles happening here in Tacoma on the Puyallup River. And the stories of those struggles have been shared with me through, periodically throughout my life. What I ultimately gained from hearing those stories as I grew up was a strong sense of gratitude for what my elders had gone through in order to protect our rights to exist as a culture. It's a very glaring fact to me that the luxuries that my generation enjoys would not be available to us if it weren't for the bravery and dedication of earlier generations. This bit of my cultural history would prove to be a bigger part of my future than, than I realized at the time when I was hearing all these stories as a kid. But it took an unusual path to get me standing here talking about it with you today. I grew up to become a lover of music and live performance. I have been a working musician since 2001, but I began my work becoming a musician around the age of eight when I started learning piano and performing in local musical theaters. And then I picked up saxophone and guitar in middle school and then drums in high school. High school was when I found my uh, everlasting love of weird rock music. Shortly after graduating high school, I began pursuing a future as a touring musician. This 
type of work is a labor of love and rarely pays the bills. And because of my dedication to working as a musician, I just kept a series of crappy minimum wage jobs to fill in the gaps between going on tours with my bands. I did this for roughly 10 years between 1999 when I graduated high school and 2009 when my cousin asked me to be her wingman on a blind date she was going on with a fellow Kill tribal member. Turns out this guy was a gooey deck diver for the tribe. I was super fascinated listening to him describe his job. It sounded very scary and kind of exciting. But a light bulb went off in my head when he told me the job was independent contractor work. Next slide, please. It struck me that if I could get a job as a gooey deck diver, I might finally have a job that I cared about, that made good money, and I could still up and leave on tour whenever I needed to without fear of losing that job. So I signed up for the training and got right to it. I was pretty nervous once the training started. I grew up playing in and around these waters, but it, was, it always seemed very dark and intimidating to me. So I was very surprised the first time I went open water diving and saw how much beautiful color and vibrant life there was down there. I was immediately enamored by it. It gave me the perfect mix of feelings of exhilaration and peace, and I was instantly hooked. I knew this was a place I needed to be a part of. After getting my certification in rescue diving and surface supplied air diving, I got onto a tribal harvest boat and learned how to harvest gooey duck, which involves walking around on the seafloor anywhere from 20 feet shallow to 70 feet deep, searching for and digging up gooey duck clams with a high pressure water hose. I was super lucky in that the boat I got onto was a really great crew of hardworking, fun loving, and safety oriented people. I loved my new job. I felt myself getting stronger both physically and mentally. I loved the long days of physical labor. I loved the challenge of facing my fears and using the ritual procedure to stay calm. Uh, and just as I'd hoped, I was still able to stay as active as I needed in my music life. I also found myself getting more and more obsessed with the underwater world of Puget Sound. I would stay up at night researching all the things I was seeing down there. I wanted to know as much as I could about all of it. This growing obsession started to create a shift in how I felt about my harvest work. Four years into harvesting, my love for and connection to Puget Sound had me feeling guilty about stomping around down there digging holes. It was a complicated feeling <laughs> because I still felt passionate about that work being valuable to our tribe's prosperity, both culturally and financially. It's a great way to keep our people out of poverty and keep us connected to each other and connected to our tribe. So I wasn't mad at the job. I was just no longer the right guy for the job. So I reached out to the tribe's shellfish bio biologist and let him know how I was feeling and asked if there were other work opportunities for tribal divers that lent to sustaining, managing, and restoring the subtitle saltwater environment of Puget Sound. I learned that he and the other tribal biologists did seasonal dive work in which they surveyed buoy duck and other shellfish populations to determine whether or not they were healthy enough to harvest. They began to hire me on as an independently contracted diver to help out with the surveys. This work didn't pay nearly as much as the harvest work, but it was still flexible to my music life and was more aligned with the person I was hoping to become. I continued to harvest gooey duck while also doing the survey work for the next two years. Six years into being a harvester, I decided it was time to quit harvesting for good and force myself deeper into the world of science and conservation. I had a tearful conversation with my boat captain, letting him know I was moving on, and then got myself an LLC so I could try and find other dive work that was more science oriented. But that was not a success. I applied for lots of different jobs around the region and did not get one call back. Since I was still doing all right financially because I had the um, seasonal survey work, I decided to sign on for some volunteer work so I could continue moving forward in that part of my life, even though I was striking out on finding a new paying job to fill in the gaps between the survey dive jobs. I got in with a local nonprofit called Harbor Wild Watch doing what they call citizen science beach surveys. Uh, and I began to think of this as my street education. I wasn't getting paid, but I was learning a lot and meeting new like-minded people. It also opened the door to paid work in the future. A woman named Dr. Bonnie Becker, who has a lab at University of Washington Tacoma, ha had, some, um, had received some funding to work on research projects that had come out of a gift from the Puyallup tribe to the University of Washington with the stipulation that at least one of the people they hired to work on the research projects be a tribal member because the tribe was hoping to inspire members to get involved in STEM. Bonnie heard from multiple people that I had either worked with or volunteered for that I would be a good candidate, so next thing I knew I was in her lab identifying and documenting bivalve larvae under a microscope 
for an Olympia Oyster Restoration Project she was involved in. And I was getting paid! <laughs> so I cannot stress enough how much volunteer work opened so many doors for me, not just in the money department, but just meeting so many new people and getting so many more opportunities um, to do this kind of work. At this point, between the tribal biologists, Bonnie at UW Tacoma, and the people I was doing volunteer work with, I had a pretty strong cheerleading team of people encouraging me to go back to school so that I could get more involved in marine science. They convinced me I could do it at my own pace and I wouldn't have to give up my goals in my music life. So I enrolled at UW Tacoma and started chipping away at a degree in environmental science with a focus on marine ecology. I also had the privilege of being able to present a poster on some of the research I had assisted Bonnie's lab with at the Salish Sea Conference in 2018. That conference was awesome. Uh, it was my first science conference, and there was a relatively strong presence of local tribes speaking there. It was the first time that I heard the term indigenous science, which, for those of you who don't know this term, is basically just describing the knowledge that indigenous people have collected over tens of thousands of years of surviving and thriving in this region pre-European contact. This concept really inspired me. It got me thinking back on what I had learned from hearing all those stories about the fishing wars when I was growing up, and how I might be able to contribute to the path of prosperity that my elders had fought so hard to forge for us. As of today, I'm still playing music, chipping away at earning a bachelor's degree, and continuing my work with the tribe, UW Tacoma, and Harbor Wild Watch. My hope is that my active presence in these communities will contribute to nurturing the collaborative relationship that was created by our elders when they hashed out that 50-50 split of our ever-precious natural resources during the fishing wars. The reality, regardless of how it came to be, is that this beautiful region is now packed full of humans of many different cultural backgrounds that all want a piece of the abundance. If we hope to be able to achieve and sustain that abundance, we need to nurture a true partnership among fishermen and scientists and tribal and non-tribal community members. Equal voices and open ears. We need to do the work to understand our history and how it got us where we are today, and then accept that history and move forward, lending an egoless hand to the restoration and conservation of the things we have all fought to have a part of. This part always chokes me up. <laughs> it's not even that much of a thing, but it just does it to me. <laughs> Um, <laughs> we live in such a beautiful place, <laughs> and we are so lucky to be here. This place deserves our protection and cooperation. <laughs> and I really hope to be one of the forces of facil facilitation in that process. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Almost made it through. <laughs> well, thank you so much for that. We do have a bit of time for questions. If anybody in the audience has a question they'd like to ask, you can shout it out. Or I have a few questions as well, so we can start with that. Um, so sustainable fishing is all about balancing human needs with those of other spe species and ecosystems. And do you think that balance is possible? And if so, how do we even get there? Huh. Big question for a noob. <laughs> um, yeah, very complicated. I mean, yeah, sure, I think it is. I don't know if, you know, with, he, there's so many different humans with different ideas about what's important. Getting on the same page is near impossible, I think. But the only, like I was saying, you know, the only way to get there is to, for everyone to have, you know, a spot at the table to talk about it um, and gain perspective. You know, history always, it's, you know, doomed to repeat itself if we don't learn it. And so it's a really important thing to learn that about our history here in this region so that you can, so fishermen, because I was, I was one once and I remember that mentality where there's not a lot of thought about sustaining it. You know, it's just get your pounds out when you can and yeah. get as many as you can and, and move on. So that's, um, I think, a message that needs to be received on the other end. But then on this end, keeping our minds open to the fact that these are people that, fishermen, you know, state fishermen and tribal fishermen alike, they're, this is their sustenance. This is dinner on the table, taking care of their families. So it uh, feels life or death to them. So it's important that we're all able to hear those different sides of the story and then try and find a middle ground for that. Yes, absolutely. I totally agree. I don't know how you do that, though. <laughs> yeah. Yet, well, <laughs> working on a plan. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I have one last question, unless anyone else in the audience has questions. Oh, 
Okay, the question was, when the gooey duck are harvested, are we able to replant more? Uh, planting gooey duck, my understanding at this point in my education is extremely difficult. Um, they, when they are at a, a larval stage where they're settling, you can correct me when I say <laughs> wrong stuff. <laughs> my mentor over here. Um, they're just like little delicious, they're, they are little teeny tiny gooey ducks and they're delicious snacks for crabs. So, <laughs> and they don't, they don't dig deep right away. They stay on the surface for a few weeks. And um, so you lay out these seeds, you can't shove them down, you can't plant them for themselves, they have to plant themselves. And so there's this process, you lay them out and you just hope they don't all get eaten. And I think most of the time they all get eaten. So that's kind of the challenge. That, that's their studies, con people that I'm around are constantly talking about trying to do that. Um, and there is gooey duck farming as well. So that's a whole different situation, but we harvest wild and that's a, just a different, whole different thing. <laughs> understand your question um, it's all about regulation so you can only harvest to a certain percentage of, of the population so my job now is going down and counting gooey ducks at spots where they're currently harvesting previously harvested or hoping to harvest and um, so in that context we go down and make sure that there's enough of a population to be harvesting on it and that's currently how we hope to regulate it that's what we're doing right now to regulate it Great. Unless there are any other group questions, Chris? Can we expect to see a new Lowe's in album in the, before the end of the year? Uh, no. <laughs> but thanks for asking. <laughs> um, I'd like to invite you all to give another round of applause to the Zoji for such an amazing Thank you guys. <laughs> um, at 1 p.m. we'll have a performance by Cello Scratch and Yanover in over there. And at 1.30 p.m. we'll be back here for our third and final OceanX talk. Thank you all for coming, and I hope you have a good time at the festival. I saw you, and I almost came over to sit with you, but I was like, no, it's a little long.